tonight we're going to uh, change the agenda slightly. The class website says we were going to do uh, Diane Burton uh, on our videotape on organizational issues. But as we got together, we decided it's much better to be live and in person with real live examples. So Yoast is going to be doing the first part of the evening, uh, talking about uh, MIT startups and people issues. And I'll pick it up after the break. OK, if there aren't any other um, announcements or questions, I'll turn it over to Yost Bonson. Yost uh, will introduce himself, but he's, uh, he's been a real, he, he actually got this course sort of started in the direction uh, a, a while ago. And uh, I'm very uh, appreciative for all of his efforts in pushing along and helping out uh, over the years. So uh, Yost, take it away. All right, Joe, thanks very much. <laughs> It's true, Joe had been a founding judge in MIT's 100K Entrepreneurship Competition, and one of the students in that first year uh, dared him to not show up at a class that they had signed up in the IEP guide, putting Joe's name as the instructor, saying, I'm talking about the nuts and bolts of business plans. Joe showed up, and it was a non-credit class for its first few years. But as uh, MIT was dialing up its entrepreneurial program, starting the, what's now the trust, Center for MIT Entrepreneurship, uh, the time was right for us to take these IP non-credit offerings and, and escalate them, turn it into essentially the longest lasting of the credit bearing IP entrepreneurship classes. You've seen the first half last week, many key themes surrounding uh, not just the writing of a business plan, but the process of business planning, with the ultimate goal being the founding an organization and successful execution of a new venture. So really, this is the nuts and bolts of new ventures. Now today, what I really want to spend extra time on is the historical landscape of MIT uh, entrepreneurs, and in particular, to spotlight the people issue. How did the folks find one another? How did they connect? And how did things go wrong? Hopefully, you can learn some lessons from those and avoid them, uh, and also, conversely, do things right. Let me give you a taste of, of how I came into all this. I landed here as an undergrad in Course 6, 6-1 Bio, in this, so these halls are quite familiar. Um, and then ended up working not only in industry and big company, but also startup company, and then returning to MIT, Course 15. This is what's now known as the Sloan Fellows Program. But along the way, both as an undergrad and then more recently, I got my fingers in multiple things, founding not only nonprofit equivalent activities, a new startup, but also having my fingers in the, in the understanding of how MIT has been a source of inspiration and a source of incubation for startups over the years. So I want to spotlight three things that I've uh, spent a lot of time on and I think may be instructive for you all. One is the MIT 100K Entrepreneurship Competition. Uh, another is the, the, my own entrepreneurial startups, how tunes. And then third is something uh, we ran in the 1990s called the Founders Project. It was the first attempt to systematically count, do a census of all alumni entrepreneurs. Let me touch on each of those in turn. First, 100K, MIT Entrepreneurship Competition today has a $100,000 prize fund. When I was running it, we were $10,000 prize fund and $10,000 in debt. So there was a lot of climbing I had to do to, to get out of it. But it was a fantastic experience from the point of view of, of realizing what was missing from our entrepreneurial landscape. As a student-run competition, inspiring and encouraging other students to participate, this is a vehicle for getting people to put their money where their mouth is with the discipline of a deadline. So these logos represent companies that were entrants as students, essentially your predecessors, your peers back then, uh, thinking about a, a startup. So Iran Agozi and Alex Rogopoulos were both master students in Todd Mockover's group at the Media Lab, they had the idea of making consumer music video accessible. That's what begat harmonics, the company that later shipped Guitar Hero, Rock Band. I mean, it's famous as the, really the pioneers of an entire genre of music intense video games with hardware peripherals, the, the guitar. Mimeo is the ultimate name of Virtual Inc., the technology whose business plan is one of the class readings, and on Thursday, we'll hear the full arc of that particular live case story when the founder, Yonald Cherry, comes and tells what happened from the point of view of every single round of financing, as well as what lessons has he drawn from that experience, including a really important 
couple of nuggets around our topic tonight, people issues. Because Yonald entered actually two different years. The first year he entered was my year. And two years later, he had a much more organized entry, much more coherent. He'd recruited in complementary classmates to be part of the team. He had written a plan as opposed to what amounted to a technical pr proposal and really upped his game. So you hear from y'all about the Mimeo story. Silicon Spies, these guys as founders met uh, over in the AI lab, ultimately founded a company that sold for a billion dollars to Broadcom. NetGenesis is uh, perhaps the first, maybe the second MIT 100K company to go public, a bunch of fraternity brothers. Their first investment was by Brad Feld, venture capital alumnus from MIT, venture capitalist today. Uh, he will join us tomorrow night on the financing panel. He's one of the venture, venture financiers. Uh, we date all the way back to this time when this was one of his very first, maybe even the first, uh, venture capital investment. Fanta was the first company to sell from my cohort, was uh, began a bunch of fraternity brothers getting together, ultimately selling to uh, an R.R. Donnelly. Nanowave in the upper left for you. Uh, before the nano revolution, these guys were a spin-off from Kodak's Japan Digital Labs. Kodak wound those down, one of the many elements of their unfortunate saga. The Japanese uh, technician who was part of that effort ended up doing his further studies here at MIT. And the combination of what he did then and later inspired him to start this nanowave metrics uh, business. And finally, the top center, sensible technologies. That was the winner of the 100K, the second year I ran it. This is an AI lab fellow, Tom Massey, who uh, had the idea of doing force feedback systems. And he actually made a work prototype, did it on his own account, but ultimately decided to go with MIT's technology licensing office because he wanted the extra credibility that comes from having MIT pursue uh, his patents. He ultimately founded the business with his old lab boss. They have themselves quartered in the area surrounding MIT, just to the north, right behind the NECO building, what's now Novartis. And it turns out down the hall was another MIT spin-off company, Cambridge Decision Dynamics. And the CEO of that was a guy named Bill Ouellette. Bill had just finished his MIT Sloan Fellows stuff. He was working with two PhD students out of Sloan and civil engineering on a new system dynamics consultancy. But Bill was drawn down the corridor to see what was going on with this touch feedback business. Well, very excited about it. Ultimately shifted businesses, joined them as their CEO, and took Sensible, raised an additional $30 million in venture financing, helped grow the company quite substantially. Now, I mention all that because this guy, Bill Ouellette, today, he's the managing director of the Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship. All right, it's full circle. This is a person who himself experienced many of the things that you're about to go through. Now, all those were the cohort of my year running the 100K. Of course, since then, there's a much larger number of companies that we can draw some lessons from. And in fact, the very concluding points of tonight, my session here, will be looking at the actual failure modes of some of those 100K alumni companies and companies coming through classes such as this. Things that actually got started, but where the team went wrong, or something broke. And I just want to spotlight those examples and hopefully help you avoid them. Now, okay, this is one thing running as a you know, club, an extracurricular activity at MIT. That's a, an entrepreneurial act. It requires being organized or at least somewhat coherent. Uh, I, in turn, wanted to do my own venture. And, and really, the mashup of ideas that I wanted to pursue are represented by these left and right clusters of objects. I, I wanted to take the MIT spirit, men's and modest, mind and hand, learning by doing. Right? It's the essence of this place. And I wanted to mash it up with what I loved as a kid, the media, in particular comics, graphic novels, illustrated mechanisms. What I first read, how I learned not only to read in Dutch, but then when we migrated to this country, learned how to read English by reading comics, translated into the new language. Well, Asterix, Prince Valiant, Tintin, those were the stuff of my youth. So the mashup between these two is Men's and Madison Media. It's 
how-to cartoons. And indeed, how-tunes, this is just one example of a how-to cartoon. In this case, it's Das Bottle, which is a soda bottle submarine. It's how every kid can scratch around for parts and materials and make it happen. Now, how did this occur? I wanted to do this mashup. I'm not a terribly good illustrator. Not bad, but not great. Ended up floating the idea as a random side comment to one of my former students, a guy named Saul Griffith, who is a doctoral student at the Media Lab. I said, hey, Saul, why don't we just make comics that show kids how to build things? And he says, great idea. Reaches up to his bookshelf, pulls a hundred-year-old book off the shelf, Young Boys Illustrated Mechanic. It's the kind of stuff they sold back then to the early days of the scouting world. He said, we need to reinvent this and not have it be just for boys, but have it for boys and girls. And not have it be these boring things or these deadly things that were allowed then. We need to do stuff that's more realistic for today. And so this is the kind of idea that emerged. We then floated this notion on a job seek board, the equivalent of Elance, founded, by the way, by yet another uh, MIT alum, uh, and said, look, we're looking for artists. So out of that, Nick Tregata bubbles up. He's one of five people who, who say, hey, I'm, I'm keen on this idea. Let me have at it. He had drawn Spider-Man and you know, comic superheroes before. Uh, so with a test strip, we floated the bills. We scrounged around for some money and said, OK, we'll make it happen. He ended up starting. And that escalated. And ultimately, we ended up starting this as a business, published our how-tunes, first graphic novel, do these one-pagers. That's just one example of, well, it's my own personal example of doing what we all hope you will do. Just make it happen. Now, the third thing I wanted to intro with is this MIT founder's study. When I was running the 100K, one of my frustrations was looking at the Inc. listing of most successful entrepreneurship schools and seeing Babson at the top of the list. I'm like, well, Babson's a good school. Roger Babson's an MIT alumnus who started a financial service business and then donated his estate to create a new business school. People forget that. And we have all these interesting alumni companies, but people forget those. Maybe we should point at the list. Oh, it doesn't exist. All right, fine. Talk myself into a role working for MIT, collecting the numbers. And that on the left published by Bank Boston in 1997, is the MIT Impact of Innovation Study. Uh, we counted, it was a census, 4,000, actually a little bit more than that, companies worldwide employing over a million people with gross annual revenues on the order of a quarter trillion US dollars. And this is 1995-ish data. Now, <clears throat> big numbers. Chuck Fast, the president at the time, quoted this, part of MIT's fundraising campaigns. Gordon Brown, chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK, reads this on his summer vacation at Martha's Vineyard. Says, hey, we should do this Cambridge MIT initiative. Yeah. 70 million pounds later, they have an engagement. These kinds of documents not only are about the celebration of our past, our legacy, but are also inspiration for new things, new connections, MIT relationships, and more. Uh, this bottom chart, is one of the first analyses I did of the resulting data was to say, OK, how many companies do our people start every year? We didn't know. We know how many the TLO counts because they license a new startup company every two weeks based on MIT-related research. But how many startups do our alumni found on a regular basis? Well, now we can look and see we're roughly doubling per decade over the last several decades in the number of companies founded but the projection of the 1990s was that all the order of 1,500 plus or minus a few hundred would be started. That's about 150 companies a year, or one to 200 companies per year. That's on the order of two to three companies a week funded by our alumni, right? dramatically more than are started by formal licensing of technologies here in labs. But Professor Ed Roberts, MIT Sloan School colleague, and his then doctoral student Chuck Easley, now a professor out at Stanford, said we need to look uh, and upgrade these data. So this study on the right, founded by the Entrepreneurial Foundation, Kaufman, was an attempt to, to come up with new data. They surveyed all alumni, got data about the currently existing ventures, and then extrapolated, because they figured they were undercounting the total number of companies. Uh, and, and they assert that the impact is, in fact, much larger. You can read for yourself the punchline numbers 
This is a really important phenomenon. And it's not just MIT. Harvard's numbers are probably even bigger. Stanford, same. And it's not just the big, well-known schools. This phenomenon of graduates going and starting building and growing economically noteworthy things is key to most of the Boston metro schools, and I would argue probably any school that has you know, remotely entrepreneurial uh, student body. But we needed to count these things, and this is the first effort to do it. Now, that's the most surprising thing that I had no idea about when I was an undergraduate here, is uh, what does this kind of wealth mean to MIT? Now, you all know the campus. We zoom in on this, uh, if you will, the east wing. This is where most of the research labs are, all the teaching facilities. Um, you recognize these building names and numbers, or at least numbers. You know, we're in the EG and G, Edgerton, Germanshausen, and Greer room, funded by Professor Edgerton and his two students who started the company, E and G and G. We're next to the Stata Center, building 32, funded by Ray Stata, who founded LI Devices. Indeed, you can go and walk through the campus and see that indeed all these different things were made economically possible by the generosity of alumni, philanthropy, and others too, not just the lumps. So I thought, why not map to the campus the logos of the companies that were the sources of the wealth of the donations? And that gives you some taste of just who had been doing what and then decided that MIT would benefit. All right, these are the oldest. Now we got the money before they went bankrupt. Uh, actually, it was George Eastman himself whose number two guy, Frank Lovejoy, was the source of inspiration. Lovejoy said, listen, this MIT is my alma mater. I'd love for you to be supportive of it. That's how it happened. Lovejoy and a dozen other MIT alums were Eastman's best employees uh, and well-treated, practically co-founders of the business. The DuPont family, of course, the business started years ago before MIT was founded, but it dialed up because of the DuPont brothers who were here at MIT in chemical engineering. This is an example of an entrepreneurial organization. Same ethos, different kind of, different kind of startup. Um, perhaps the most surprising, we all know the Green Building. Tallest building on the MIT campus, headquarters of Earth Sciences. It's not called Green because of what's in it. Turns out it's called Green because of Cecil Green, and Ida, his wife, who graduated from this very department and then moved to Texas because they said it's too cold in Cambridge. He ended up getting into the oil prospecting arena, teamed up with some partners down there, um, ultimately quite successful in the, doing what today Halliburton Schlumberger do. But being an engineer, he said, I can do this work better if I had tools. So he started building some instruments. And uh, yeah, indeed, the oil companies who were their clients pretty soon said, listen, we like your services, but we really want to buy those instruments. Will you sell it to us? Uh, Cecil Green is no fool. He and his business partner said, you bet, and we should start a company to do these instruments. And that's why Texas Instruments happened. Now, Green later in life remembered the geophysicist who were so helpful to him in the very beginning when he was struggling to get the business going. Now, I just thought like those examples. There are many others. Building 16, Dorrance, named after the founder of Campbell, said, all MIT related people, one way or another. I, well, we just don't even know this. I thought I'd share this at least with you. And then also to say, let's abstract away. Look at some of the biggest companies that are founded by our alumni. These logos represent that. You can look. There's the founding of entire fields. Biotechnology, semiconductors, consumer electronics, foods, others, consumer goods. Uh, let's look at, at how the teams formed for these various firms. Um, this go down the list. Analog devices. You know, this is a data center. Well, Ray State didn't do it alone. He had his Baker House dorm mate, Matthew Lorber, to work with. DAC, digital equipment, now dead or merged into what's, what's left of Hewlett Packard. But Ken Olson and Harlan Anderson were lab mates out at Lincoln Labs. And they decided, you know, now's the time for doing digital computing and spinning it out of what was military funded research, turning it into was really a pioneer of the microcomputer, mini computer uh, arena paradigm. Alex de Arbeloff, 
an undergrad in course 15, Sloan, was sitting next to, in Rotsi class, alphabetically, Nick DeWolf. So Darbo up and DeWolf later in life said, hey, look, this friendship we've had since undergrad days, now is the time to turn this into a big test equipment systems business. Uh, and they did, successfully. Akamai, two Israelis, one over at CSAIL, or what's then uh, Lab for Computer Science, um, one over at MIT Sloan School, Seelig and Lewin. And this crazy competition was happening at MIT for business plans. Lewin uh, was friendly to Seelig's suggestion that why not take a crack at this. Just a few weeks earlier, Lewin had heard from his advisor, Tom Layton, of a problem that Tim Berners-Lee, the creator of the web, had floated next to the water cooler. Berners-Lee said, look, the traffic on the internet is growing such that there will be congestion and delays and bottlenecks. We should figure out today a solution to this growing problem. And if we can, that's going to be a big business for somebody. Now, Berners-Lee throws these things off as ideas. Leighton floated this by his doctoral student, Lewin, who said that may be the basis for an, a new venture. It was, in fact, what led to Akamai, Internet Caching System. Direct hit was a Harvard Law School student frustrated with the crappy search qualities available at the time. Came to MIT thinking, hmm, maybe I, with my domain knowledge, he had been a patent clerk, can connect with somebody who likes this new search phenomenon and we can do business. And, and indeed, he met at a mixer we held at the, at the Media Lab. Um, and ultimately, one of the judges in the first round of MIT competition, Hunter K, he said, this is such a good idea, I quit as a judge, I'm joining these guys as a team. Uh, that's Mike Cassidy, who later went on to found two more ventures. The most recent sold to Google for a pile of coin, another MIT alum. You know, Silicon Spice I mentioned earlier, ultimately selling for a billion. Interestingly, this is a guy, Ian Eslick, one of the co-founders, who took a pause from his MIT studies. <coughs> so this is sort of one up on Gates or Zuckerberg. After selling the company for a billion, uh, he decided, okay, now it's time to finish that PhD I put on hold back when I started the company in the first place, after my master's and my undergrad degree. So he is just finishing now at the Media Lab in his doctoral program after the company. Virtual link you'll hear about on Thursday. Gillette. Now, I, this one surprised me. I had no idea that the Gillette, the razors business, I don't know, am I an MIT person? Yeah, it turns out. It's almost a classical example of the kinds of relationship that, that some of you are going to seek out and hope to find. King Gillette was a bottle cap salesman, and he knew how to sell, uh, you know, ice to Eskimos, an incredible salesman. And he had this idea, what if we could convince American men to cut their facial hair, and that that would be the new normal, that would be the grooming standard of tomorrow. And if we could convince them that we could create a new business model, razors and blades, where we sell them repeatedly for life, the tools to do the cutting. Great idea but he couldn't make the blades. And that's where Nickerson comes in, MIT alum, metallurgist, awkward name, Nickerson. But he figured out how to make the blades in quantity. And a sort of classical engineering genius in his day, solving the problem that the salesman, once solved, could push to all the people with the problem. In this case, a made up problem. But nevertheless, Gillette, huge business, now part of the P&G, Procter & Gamble Empire, at and who knew? The Bell system had MIT roots. Well, Bell himself was an alumnus, of course, but he did all his early work in MIT EECS labs over Cross River. Pickering, professor at the time, was friendly to this BU professor's crazy idea for voice over wires. Now, it turns out we're at the edge of history here. Uh, the very first long distance phone call was made by Bell, sitting in a building in Boston, using telegraph lines along Main Street going all the way up to what's today an MIT owned building with a biotech company in it. Well, at the time, that was the workshop where Watson sat where Bell made the first long distance call. Anyways, IBM. Walker Memorial, you all know about Walker. Walker was president of MIT in a formative time. He quadrupled the size of the university. Walker had run the US Census for two decades and was intimately aware of a problem. The Constitution mandates the counting of American citizenry on an annual, on a decadal basis, every 10 years. The problem was that you couldn't count fast enough 
to get done in a decade if you used traditional manual techniques. So Walker was intimately aware of the problem. He recruited the MIT campus, a young mechanical engineering faculty member, a guy named Herman Hollerath. He said, Hollerath, have at this problem. Because if you solve it, this is not only good for the census, but anybody else who needs to count a lot of stuff in a hurry will want whatever you come up with. And indeed, Hollerath solves this, creating the first real successful computing and tabulating machine, starts a company to commercialize it, a company we know today by its modern initials, IBM. And finally, Mach 3, every scape. The old Cherry, who you hear from on Thursday about his company while he was a student, he didn't have enough. So when he spoke in the first year of coming back to tell his story, he sat in a room much like this, up in front like you are, and was a student, again, in Mark O, finishing up his doctoral studies in CSAIL, sitting there thinking, you know, I've got in my studies something I really ought to be sold, but I'm ignorant of this world. He ended up coming up to Yonel and saying, listen, here's what I've got. What do you think? Yonel says, you know, he swore he was going to go finish his doctorate, but no, he got distracted by Moke's big concept. And they ended up starting Mach 3, now known as Everyscape. These guys did Street View before Google did. So they have a nice intellectual property portfolio. There's more of that story, especially the team dynamics, which John will share. Uh, but I just wanted to spotlight all those examples because it's so very. They all get, should give you some taste of the people that you need in order to start, build, and or grow your company come from all over the place, sometimes quite unexpected. It's not necessarily logical or normal or it's, it's obvious. So today, people issues. We'll consider a whole list of things. Just put this up here to give you the taste. Uh, you know, why should we care? And the punchline, what are some of the failure modes to avoid? Um, well, let's just go through these. First, this should not be news. On the very first session, Joe spotlighted that the planning process is about assembling these various elements of the plan from, from high concept and elevator pitch up top, ultimately to including a you know, something media about who you are doing this with. You not only are uh, building towards that, that sort of plan pyramid, but you're writing an executive summary that sums up you know, who all is doing what you're proposing, Includes the team. To flesh out a full plan, you'd want to have more background about who you are. It's not just the people who are on the team, but it's whoever else you need in order to ensure that your idea is as revised and improved as possible. So independent readers who you've got to call favors for, or somehow get them, the most interesting people, the most qualified people to do this for you. Uh, and, and, you know, to raise money, there's lots of things that are necessary not necessarily sufficient to get you there. And of course, one of them is, is you know, are you believable as people, given your background, given what we've done before? People are making a bet. You haven't done it yet. They're betting on what you've done already. And does that give them confidence you can do it again or do it in this circumstance? And conversely, one of the reasons for not getting past the first rounds of filtering uh, is because the inverse, you're not believable. So let's look at um, uh, sort of a not yet success story. I mean, they, they did quite well in, in raising the money to do what they plan to do, Synergy. As the winner of 100K last year, first ever social or developmental venture in the two dozen years of this competition to win the overall grand prize. You see, there they are, $100,000 check. This turns out to be a fantastic story, born two years earlier than this photo shot, or let's say 18 months earlier. Um, the two people in the center, Adi Balabadini, Dave Auerbach, plus one other guy who's not part of the picture, they had this notion of doing a new kind of waste energy solution. The details are not important, but the point is it was those three as MBA students with interesting backgrounds coming up with this notion to solve a real problem in developing country slum communities. But over the course of time and over the E, almost a year and a half they had to, to escalate things. They not only made multiple trips to country, right, doing market research and so forth, but they fleshed out the team. So by the time this photo was taken, they had much larger and much more diverse pool of people from MIT and the larger community. Not everybody was an MIT person. In fact, there were some Kenyans on the team too. They couldn't come for the Photoshop, but they were very important to actually making it happen. So you had the original two out of three. One of them dropped out, had a realization that this was not the venture concept for him graceful parting of ways, an important team dynamic. 
Um, but they brought on board architects, a couple undergrads. This fellow is uh, part of MIT's D Lab. Turns out he was central to the branding of the company. He's the one who cooked up their new look in you know, each one of their toilets in the slums of, 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 of Nairobi. Um, each one of these people played a different role. Some technical, some aesthetic, some planning, some design. But these guys had the idea that allowed them to go do the recruitment and the pulling together of the people and the testing of the people. Some of the folks who, who started dropped out, some of the folks who were in Kenya realized this wasn't their, their venture, so they bailed out. Some of the folks didn't, uh, weren't able to make the commitment. When this money was in hand, you'd think, okay, this is a key signature moment. Will we now commit to doing this for real? We're about to graduate. What then? Yeah. Excellent point. This is a fast-growing company. These guys have now pulled on board uh, nearly two dozen additional folks. So the time is right for this, at the time of this photograph, for making a commitment to actually join in a company. But the timing wasn't right for everybody. And this is a theme that I want to reiterate uh, in, a, in a few minutes, that sometimes there's people who are part of your team for phases of you hashing out your idea. And that's perfectly reasonable. What you want to avoid, in, in fact, you can, it's a good idea to recruit people who are willing to do it just for the purpose of the, the contest, or just for a class, or just for a phase. That's perfectly fine. But things get dicey when there's miss. Uh, aligned expectations about people's degree of involvement. If you say you're full-on committed, but you're actually only a part-timer. If you say, I'm going to do this next, but really you're hedging your bets and doing all these job interviews and finding all these other, uh, then it's unclear. You're sending mixed signals. If you say, I'd like to do this, but the money has to be right and the timing has to be right, I'm also hedging my bets. But you're being honest about it. But you see how the difference in in what in stated expectations is a real important hinge point in the success of them as a team, never mind the concept as a business proposition. Well, since then, they've not only, uh, as was pointed out, raised, uh, hired an additional two dozen people, but they've raised an additional several hundred thousand dollars, including from USAID, which is America's uh, international development agency. Um, one of their development innovation, innovation ventures grants. This is a big deal. Uh, they've also raised money from Mass Challenge. They've basically tapped into the landscape of sources of money in order to get this good idea to happen. All right. I'm a okay, alums more broadly. There are many. I don't want to spotlight all of these, although there are some very fascinating ones. I mentioned Akamai's founding story. The first publicly traded idea is the Neurometrics. This later inspired the creation of an entire class around neurotechnology ventures. Uh, I just want to point out Brontes as one example. So he had a mechanical engineering professor, Doug Hart, who was doing essentially cheap three-dimensional photography. He took a camera and put a rotating pinhole in front of it, and some computation, and you could do depth measurement. He thought, surely this should have commercial consequences. He built it to solve a problem he had, which was imaging fluid flow. But he thought, of, hmm, maybe other possibilities are out there. They end up teaming up with some, some people from a totally different world, business school. And ultimately, this technology, which had many possible vertical application domains, they thought security, they thought just a ton of different ideas. Almost the bottom of the list was this, this sector that people most of the people involved as engineers had no knowledge of. And that sector was dental. The problem that they realized dentists had was that the traditional mechanism for getting a three-dimensional model of a tooth required putting very not tasteful, not tasty goop in your mouth to get an impression. That would in turn get pulled out and you would scan this resulting thing. Now, there's inherent distortion in this process. The pulling out of goop distorts. And it's just an unpleasant period. So these guys realized, if they could come up with a handheld device on the order of the size of this dongle that a dentist or a dental tech could use to get an instantaneous 3D scan of a tooth or teeth, wow, this would be a game changer. 
And it was on that basis that they ultimately raised a bit more money, built early working prototypes beyond what the professor and his, his postdoc had done in the, in the lab, uh, and, and ultimately built something that was sold to, to 3M for 80 plus million dollars. Now, it's a sad story because 3M screwed up the acquisition and ultimately the team is now disbanded. But it's a happy story because the very team that was successful in executing on Bronte's, the dental imaging business, said, you know, there are other medical sectors also benefiting from this realization. So the team has now gone on to do a company called Lantos, which is ear imaging for the hearing aid market, which has a similar problem of having to pour goop in the ear in order to get a measure. So Doug Hart, the professor, has had his eyes opened by this realization about identifying market opportunities, the problem that he was uniquely positioned and his team were uniquely positioned to solve. And there's actually more companies in that mix. And if you care about that theme, certainly participate in imaging ventures class this spring where these are the live case studies. All right. I think I've made the point that the people uh, who you find and interact with over the course of your time window here are important. And so getting better at connecting with those people beyond the circles that you already know is highly in your interest, should be a top priority. So maybe a few sort of macro pointers about how to do this. Uh, <coughs> Serendipity is key to this all. You don't realize going into a relationship or a conversation how the person may ultimately be relevant to you or vice versa, how what you know may be relevant to them. So you have to, in some sense, be open to this possibility. This is one of the reasons that, that even a shy person or a retiring person should get effectively on stage and act. You heard this on our first night where a seemingly you know, boisterous speaker shared with you all, look, to get up here is not easy for me. My normal mode is being pretty retiring. I'd rather be, I mean, I'm a shy person. So getting up here and speaking to you all is an, is an act, much like an actor getting on stage and being in the, ca in the character is an act. Now, it's not a lie. It's just putting on a particular sort of mode of interaction. Uh, and in some sense, that's what you need to do. Even if you don't like cocktail parties, you got to get in the mood of being in cocktail party hour and, and, and do things that you would not, so force yourself to try things that are not part of your normal, uh, normal mode. Uh, because it is indeed true, being affiliated with this community or with the, the circles that are around us puts you within a few degrees of separation from almost anybody who's relevant. Prospective investor, prospective customer, potential partner, potential employees, just the, the laundry list of people who are likely to be relevant to you. Um, now, in this, one of the conversations that has popped up in past years, especially among uh, some of our engineering students, is like, look, I've got something great, and I don't want to spill the beans. I don't want to share my secrets to just anybody. And they've got a very good point that, in fact, there are things that you shouldn't be saying because, A, you don't want to reveal prematurely, B, you don't want to give up the chance of securing your intellectual property if, indeed, it's an original and compelling thing. But at the same time, and this is the important piece, you should be able to figure out how to convey the summary essentials of what you're doing in such a way as to not give away the gold, is to not spill the secrets. So one obvious tactic here is, is to say, here's the problem I'm solving, because that gives nothing away about how you're solving it. Another is to, is to remain relatively vague until circumstances inspire you to be more specifically detailed, until the person you're talking to you know something about, until you know something about the context in which you're spilling the, the secrets. Uh, but under all circumstances, you ought to, as a minimum, be able to summarize the big picture essentials in such a way that you could say it to anybody. And not only that, anybody ought to be able to understand the essence of what you're saying. In other words, it can't be full of jargon or buzzwords or three-letter acronyms or other things that make an otherwise good idea unintelligible to an, in, 
intelligent but ignorant listener. Uh, anyways, I summarize this ethos uh, as, as sort of being ready for or you know, being sort of orchestrating your own serendipity. By the way, this is something that a good hosts of events and activities and classes do. This is one of the things that makes them great. You know, when you go to an event and you're like, wow, that was amazing. Well, in part, it's the ambiance and so forth, but in part, it's how did the host welcome you and connect you to interesting people and vice versa. More about that in a minute. This list should be of no surprise to anybody. You need all these skills and types of people, but something that, that you may not be as resonant to is the idea of having temporary collaborators. I mentioned this in the case of Sanity. There's all sorts of people who are your who are your partners uh, along parts of the walk. And this is especially true in academia, when you have many people who they converge here to be in a great place, but then go off to their, their other jobs, their other opportunities. But while here, you can really help each other in a, in a positive way, be part of something, but not be maybe a co-founder of the ultimate company. Uh, and that's a legitimate and valuable thing to, to encourage and to appreciate, to be part of. The other is competitors. You know, you're here, most of you, in an academic environment. This is neutral ground. Right? You have the ultimate, all-purpose excuse to engage with almost anybody while here. Because you're not yet starting the company, you're just thinking about it. You haven't yet committed to the new venture or the new product line. You're considering it. So while here, you should be doing market research. You should say, I'm exploring this, this market segment. I ought to talk to all the competitors that are the key and who ultimately I think will be relevant in this market segment. Now, that's an especially good excuse if you're currently in academia. Right? For some, or alums, or people in a larger community, that doesn't work quite so well. Uh, because it's not true, so you shouldn't say it. Uh, but for those of you in the academic context, really, this is part of t making the very most of your, your, your time at MIT. All right. Who are the talent that you have around you? This is sort of historical stats, but the important part is the last column, which is the current situation. Over 10,000 students at MIT, two-thirds graduate students from over 100 countries around the world uh, in all five MIT schools, and 1,000 faculty. And this is a target-rich environment. There are so many compelling and interesting people hailing from all, all parts of the planet, uh, and they're here on this campus. And this campus alone physically is surrounded by a venture zone. This is a patchwork quilt of business parks. And this is where all these interesting companies, potential clients, partners, suppliers, people who are currently employed by these in these places are thinking of making a move. They're all located in the near neighborhood surrounding MIT. We're 10, 15, 20 minutes walk from thousands of interesting additional people beyond the 20,000 on campus. And, and depending on your sector, and some of you care about life science and biomedical devices. Well, in that case, this kind of map is your uh, networking target list. Right? Here we have the campus. Every single one of those red dots and lines represents one of the over 100 biotech life science companies within a short walk of campus. You zoom out to sort of Boston Metro. Here you see that Anertech, this is energy and clean technology mashup in the greater Boston metro area, all those red lines and dots, and this chunk here is the Cambridge chunk. This chunk is, is even longer now because Boston is faster growing than Cambridge as a home for clean tech companies. And it's, it's, it's also um, stupid to limit yourself just to MIT as a circle because look at this. You can't see the, the outline of the city of Boston terribly well, but I hope you can recognize some of these names, Harvard, MIT, Bentley, uh, Brandeis, and dozen other universities. This is relatively zoomed in, so you don't even see Babson and Wellesley and Olin and, and many of the, the universities in the bird. This is an amazing thing, a quarter million students in the greater Boston metro area. A talent pool that's attracted like a magnet from the planet to this place is really amazing. Don't limit yourself to just being MIT, for that matter, being you know, engineering or Sloanly or something. You should tap into this education cluster now. Who occupies the physical real estate around us? Turns out that we're in the hub, as entrepreneurs thinking of starting up companies, of uh, you know, this, this huge ecology 
And each one of these sort of circles represents parts of that ecology, the service providers, the lawyers, the various flavors, the other companies whose executives are in some sense your peers or you, you aspire to be their peer. Um, this is the venture network. Now there are mechanisms which will help you, facilitate you tapping into these, and that's one thing I'd like to spotlight next. So, okay, MIT is a complicated place. Billion dollars worth of annual research volume, 10,000 students. But we can simplify what happens here by talking about it as a pipeline. And for the most part, MIT is an institution. All the people here are concentrating on learning things in a classroom or doing things in a lab. And that is this basic and applied research. This is the, the beginning of the pipeline in some sense. Talent comes in, we do stuff, plus money. Some of those things, commercially right. They can have an impact now. Not eventually, it's not just a contribution to, to knowledge, but there's something that's been built that's, that's ready. And I told you about the technology licensing office. Getting roughly one invention record per day, ultimately licensing one startup company on average every two weeks. Well, uh, ultimately some of those spin off. And in the far right column, that's where all those logos that I showed at the beginning of, this, of the talk you know, are now located. So let's look at how MIT organizes within in order to support action at various phases, stages of this pipeline. Uh, the top line represents some, there are more, because it's too complicated to list everything without being really cluttered, some of the elements that academic and research offices that are supportive of entrepreneurial things. I spotlight two in the middle on top, the Spanish Center, anchored in the School of Engineering, run by Leon Sandler, started by Christina Holley, herself an alumna, winner of MIT's 100K. She later decided to go into academia and be not only head of MIT's Deshmina Center, she moved out to USC, is now the vice provost for entrepreneurial action there. Well, that center did the seed funding that enabled the Brontes team to happen. I just told you about Brontes, the, the 3D vision company that turned into a dental products business. That, that center has doled out several million dollars on an annual basis for the better part of the last decade to do this kind of bridge funding to encourage good ideas to get to go forward. Now, is that the faculty making those proposals and saying, you know, I want to do all the work to make this happen? No. For the most part, it's the motivated students and researchers and research assistants and postdocs and others in the faculty groups that have the ideas that, that the faculty are supported by. Now, it's not that the faculty are not important here, but it is to say that this is a vehicle that you can tap into. The Vista Spanish Center is also what supports and underwrites the iTunes class, where students, teams of engineering and business or technical and, and business-minded people uh, are working with uh, several dozen faculty on an annual basis to explore the commercial potential for their new inventions. Right? That's yet another channel for identifying you know, prospective new, new company. And then I talk about the MIT Entrepreneurship Center, now recently renamed Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship, named after who? Marty Trust and his daughter, both MIT alum, <laughs> both entrepreneurial in totally different ways. Uh, Lisa Trust, the daughter, she runs Finagle Bagel. This is a consumer goods entrepreneur after her time at Sloan. Well, the father, Marty Trust, he runs the, the family of clothing companies that you might know as the Limited and a few others. Anyways, been very supportive and entrepreneurial and helpful to MIT. And this middle layer is about the support organizations. And in that, I want to especially spotlight the TLO. They're the ones who are formally responsible for documenting and filing for patents for the ideas that you have. Uh, and the MIT Enterprise Forum, which Joe used to be the chairman of, is today uh, several dozen chapter alumni inspired. It's actually run by Technology Review, MIT's magazine of innovation. Uh, these chapters around the world are not only for alums in those different locations, but also for anybody in the, in the greater geographic area that they represent. Now, to take one example, the MIT Enterprise Forum of the Pan Arab Reach is operated out of Lebanon has for the last six years been running a business plan competition. Right. So this is a leverage. This is like MIT 100K on the road. This is MIT style stuff being distributed as institutional infrastructure to other parts of the planet. It's incredibly important. And when you graduate from here, maybe 10% of you on average will stay in the greater Boston metro area. Right. So the 90% who are going elsewhere on the planet 
this is what you want to tap into. It's a friendly welcome to a new place. And you should tell your buddies, it's not just for MIT people, it's for anybody who cares about being entrepreneurial. And the bottom line is the extracurriculars. I've already emphasized that MIT 100K is an example, but there are many others. Entrepreneurs Club and Engineering, Entrepreneurship and Innovation Club at Sloan, uh, and others. Now, those organizations, especially ones in the middle, run a ton of things. Now, being aware of all of them means paying attention to MIT events page, signing up for various email lists, you know, getting yourself as connected as possible so that you are aware of the big events, the conferences up top, the smaller, more boutique things, for people exploring new possibilities. Uh, Media Lab alum Corey Kidd, when he was finishing his doctoral studies, making a coach robot, weight loss coach as a robot, uh, he ended up participating at MIT Enterprise Forum uh, concept clinic. He said, you know, I think this idea might be the basis for a business. That was the very first uh, public revelation he made about what he was thinking of, and he got feedback from the mentors and advisors who participated in that. So he did a while student participating in an organization that's supportive of, of alumni and students more broadly. And this is actually so rich and complicated a, a, a listing, it's very difficult to get your hands on all of it. Uh, but as a minimum, paying attention to the events page, going to local news organizations, mass high tech, economy, all things that concentrate on the business and events, news in our geography, that's a minimum thing to do. All right, we talked a little big picture, serendipity, and so forth. Uh, how about some tactics? This is a nuts and bolts class, so nuts and bolts. Everybody should have a contact card. Now, I've had dozen engineering students come meet me during class or afterwards. And, oh, I don't have a business card. It's like, well, you're not running a business or a part of one. Why should you have a business card? But you do need a mechanism for us or anybody else to get a hold of you, shouldn't you? So everybody should have a contact card. And this is so obvious. Go to CopyTech. They've got a turnkey form. You pay a little bit of money and get a couple hundred cards. There's people who will supply you free cards, as long as you put a little bit of their advertising on the card. Just do yourself a favor, everybody. You will get an F if you don't finish uh, this, this IAP this January, uh, having not gotten your own contact card. Now, elevator pitch. Joe highlighted this, in fact, we took the two talks in the beginning of the semester, in the beginning of this, this, this uh, nuts and bolts session, for representing your concept. This is something you should be practicing all the time. Elevator pitches, you know, whatever you're thinking about is your new cool idea. Whoever you run into, summarize a variation on it. Practice. Sometimes, uh, you know, people say, what's up, Yost? I said, well, shit, I've been thinking about a dozen different ideas. Let me try one of them. And whoever I'm talking to gets to be my practice guinea pig on the latest of the ideas. It turns out that repeat practice with a variety of people uh, you never know who has this sort of pithy, cutting comment that helps you refine it, really. Or they say, oh, jeez, I had no idea you were interested in that topic. Did you know so-and-so is working on that or has fixed that or has solved that? So the actual mechanism for, for, for having to boosting the odds that you have these serendipitous connections is to make sure that everybody in your circles knows what you most care about. And the fastest way, pithiest way of getting what you care about across is this mechanism of, of the elevator pitch, this summary in on the order of 30 seconds to a minute of what's on your mind. Now, uh, <clears throat> I say ask the host for help. What I mean is, when I, and in fact today still, I hate events where I don't know anybody. I mean, it's just, it makes me very nervous. I, if I walk into something and, and I know nobody, it's just frustrating. <clears throat> But, okay, now I'm better at this. So what I do is I say, well, who invited me to the event? And who on the floor seems like they know more people than I do and seem friendly enough for me to walk up to them and say, hey, listen, I'm new here, don't know anybody, but I'm especially interested in some aspect of your elevator pitch. Ten seconds, a few key words. If they have the time, a minute. And they say, oh, well, geez, let me introduce you to this person. Because that's the host's job, is to make the introductions. They are likely to know the majority of the people in the room 
either directly or indirectly. And so if asking that person for help is the highest you know, bank or above way of getting connected to who's most likely to be of interest to you and who's most likely to be interested in you, this is so obvious, but actually doing it, actually taking the, the host and, and, and saying, listen, I need a favor. I'm looking to find so-and-so or people who care about this topic or I'm looking for this kind of person. Who do you recommend? Uh, I personally like to... Uh, is the bar, uh, but it's bad to hang out there for too long. Uh, usually better to position yourself, you know, at least around the, the doorway so you can see who's coming in and out. And sometimes people who you've been meeting to say hello to or walking out, you're in a close position to just say hello. Hey, by the way, I want to just introduce myself, that kind of thing. Um, and then make the point of going, right? I mean, you have to figure out which events are happening and then start attending. Now we're in a target-rich environment here. Uh, the Graduate Student Hub is one venue for those over 21. They tend to host things around multiple sectors. The Energy Club has regular you know, energy nights for people who care about that sector. In fact, no matter what sector you care about, technology or of industry, there's likely to be at least one to three, five schmooze sessions on a regular basis that you can participate in. And so go. Uh, yeah. And finally, for those of you who are like me and always forgetting who you just met, uh, you know, there's, there's ways to not be completely uncomfortable when connecting with somebody whose name you've forgotten. And you know, there's not much you can do in the final analysis. So you say, oh, remind me of your name again. Just get used to that because it will happen uh, unless you have a very photographic memory. But the other thing that, that is incredibly awkward is when uh, two people who you know don't know each other. And yet, you don't remember who they are. <laughs> you don't remember their names. Here's the solution. And you have to kind of pull this off. But it's, uh, you say, do you two know each other? Oh, man, God, you should introduce yourselves. <laughs> and then, <laughs> listen. And, 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 oh, that's who that is. Great. Okay. And then, because look, it's not that you've forgotten the person. It's you just don't remember their name. Right? Yeah, but that's the quick workaround. So sometimes, I mean, this I'm very bad sometimes, very bad. So I'll, I'll be talking to a person for quite a while, just not connecting with their name. And a new person comes up, and then, aha, now I can find out who this is. Uh, I can do this routine. Now you say, oh, you laugh. It's simple, but it's also effective. Because you've done two things at once. First, you've reminded yourself who they are. And second, you've done them a favor of introducing people who are part of your circles. So it's two for one. It's, it's worth doing under almost all circumstances. Now, making introductions is not uh, just a matter of saying, you know, do you two know each other, introduce yourselves. It's also saying, what is it about person A that's especially relevant to person B? And this is usually what I remember. Like, oh, this person who's very interested in this kind of venture, person B has something relevant to say about that kind of venture. And that's why they should know each other. Because otherwise, there's a cloud of possible things that they might talk about, and it's an accident if they end up honing in on the particular things that are relevant to each of them. That you, as the host or as the person doing the introduction, happen to know about each of those parties. So doing the sophisticated, the savvy introduction, the aspect of those people that they both ought to know, that's, you know, you're doing everybody a favor when you, when you do that widely. Uh, today, I don't think anybody can be in this room without having some digital presence. For those of you who are uh, alums or have been at MIT for more than I think a semester or two, you have access to the database of 100,000 plus alumni. And that infinite connection is not easy to use. It's a little it's programmed by Harvard people. Uh, but it, kidding, of course. Uh, it, it is incredibly useful, especially if you have um, an interest in, in networking into an organization that you'd like to sell to, or connecting with people in a certain geography that you'd like to do business in. Uh, you know, the MIT alumni diaspora is planet-wide. There's now upwards of 10,000 alums outside of the U.S. And of course, throughout the U.S., we're in major metro areas. So this turns out to be the further away you are from MIT, the more uh, people are friendly to your emails. <laughs> if you're here, nobody answers. But if you're far away, it turns out you're an interesting person to, to connect with if you're visiting. 
And so this is really powerful. You should take advantage of it. Uh, and it goes both ways. You're valuable to them because you're interesting. They're, you're doing something new. Yeah. LinkedIn, Facebook, I'll say no more about them, except you should have some sort of presence there. Um, you know, Facebook has tended to be a little bit more on the social side. I think it's unwise to, to put, to assume that a, an open network will not ultimately bite you in the butt if you publish too many sort of scandalous images of yourself uh, while a youth. You're probably better off being prudent on truly public media. And think of Facebook as, as, as sort of a LinkedIn light. Um, and then the other. You know, people will search for you, so what is your presence? And, and even if you're a sparse poster having a blog with some frequency, you know, weekly, monthly, is better than completely nothing. Having some kind of digital landing page saying, here's who I am, you know, CV, if nothing else. Um, because if you don't put it up, then whatever Google trawls and finds about you will be higher on the list. Right? So the incautious comment you made to the undergrad student newspaper reporter, like I made, uh, goes high on the list of searches. So you should shape the random outsiders, or more importantly, when the, the folks who are thinking of investing in your business are doing this due diligence, when they're looking, who is this again? They'll find something that you can at least have some influence over. Uh, now, clearly there's teammates in starting a new business. There's people who are investors. There's people who are customers. But one incredibly and almost an onion-like layer upon layer of, of circles that are relevant to your advisors. Some advisors are incredibly close. People you tell anything to. You tell them the deepest secrets. Uh, and some who you have for sectoral advice around domains. Um, now, that doesn't come for free. People don't just because you were in a class way back when, they may not remember you and be an advisor later in life. Advisors are people who you have to cultivate and nurture and stay connected to and update and give them tips and say, hey, by the way, here's what I'm up to now. Or, you know, you told me at one point you cared about a topic. Here's something I've uniquely discovered about that topic that may be of interest to you. Even if they already know about it, the gesture that you're investing into the relationship is a powerful one. And it's part of the favor banking that advisor, advisory networks have. Now, why, you may ask, as I did when I was an undergrad, would anybody bother with me? as this sort of unwashed engineering student who knows nothing about business. Why would somebody who's years, decades ahead of me uh, be willing to spend the time? And, you know, maybe on the face of it, it doesn't look too plausible. But what's actually going on, or at least one of the things that certainly motivates me today, is that I remember how I was back at that time. And I'm willing today to invest in a new person. Right? It's kind of a paying it forward. Because this happened to me. Right? I asked for favors from people who were I had really no, you know, was not asking for a favor return. Uh, they helped me at the time, and so today I too do the same thing. And if everybody does this, you know, we're in a sort of nice positive feedback loop, um, at least going forward. Beyond that, there are reasons why people uh, are willing to be advisors. You know, just the coolness of your idea, or the fact that you're solving a problem they know really needs to be solved, is inspiring enough to say, oh, I really want to help these guys. In some ways, MIT's organized people who are automatically advisors because they've signed up for the very role of, of helping up and coming people do this. So the venture mentoring service takes what has had been going on for a century, this informal advising, and made it slightly more formal. They now have over 100 and Joe, you remember how many? 120 plus, plus um, half alums, half others, who on a voluntary basis are willing to advise up and coming young entrepreneurs about their new ideas. And entrepreneurs means even before you've actually started your business. So one way or another, connecting early with people and allowing them to see your progress over time. That's the, probably the third thing that's most important, is if I've connected with a person and I've done them a favor, and then they come back to me a month later and say, you know what, here's what I said I was going to do. I've now done it. And by the way, not only that, I've also done these other things. The second engagement I have with the person as an advisor, I'm extra excited because they not only remembered and they said thank you, but they have come back having accomplished even more. So my motivation to help them escalate has just been positively reinforced. But that doesn't happen for free. You have to come back and revisit people and say, hey, by the way, here's an update. So, uh, if your first conversation with a potential 
investor is, you know, I'm looking for money, and that person also is somebody who you could have asked for advice from, is unwise. Right? You should have had an engagement with the person over time. Oftentimes, the most ardent advisors to your new venture, if they have the money, will flip and, in addition to being advisors, become investors because they practically sold themselves on you as, a, as, a, as an idea. And once again, this takes time. All these things have to be invested in today so that they bear fruit in three months, six months, a year plus. So no time like the present to get started. Basically, everybody should get this when they first land at MIT because you, most people are here for a very brief period of time. All right. You need all sorts of formal advice. The list is pretty obvious. Um, most of these people cost money. But for those of you in this academic context, usually initial engagements or um, early conversations or even conversations leading up to you getting your first round of financing, those conversations can be either ultra low cost or free or deferred. And organizations like extracurricular uh, businessman competition and so forth bring to the table many of these kinds of professionals who are willing to have these early conversations with you at very good price or no price at all. Um, so take advantage of this because this is how you get to know people. And it's not just a matter of finding the one lawyer who you know or the one accountant, especially legal counsel. It's having met at least three, five, work closely with at least one or two, uh, and ultimately have a strong working relationship with one. This is the only way to really get to know people is to spend some degree of time with them. Okay, uh, let's focus on, on then core team. All right, those of you who band together in order to get a particular venture idea proposed, written, you have to do an executive summary for this class. That means you and some other people banding together to do it. Um, you know, ideally, you're not all twins or people who are all from the same course or people who all have the same basic experience set. Uh, the very best case is, is people have complementary skills and collectively you all have the, the you tile the landscape of skills that you need in order to pull off your, your concept. Uh, but most people don't know folks from really diverse populations. I mean, if you're an engineer like I was, uh, you know, here as an undergrad, I had no idea how to engage with a salesperson. To me, salespeople were like used car types, right? I mean, you, you just, how can you have a conversation with this type of person and, and really judge, are they unusually good at what they do or not? There's no skill set for judging those qualities in other people. This, by the way, is one of the more useful reasons for having an advisory pool. People who've done this before, maybe among the very best people who you introduce your potential partners to, and ask them to do the interview on your behalf or with, to, with the goal of helping you make a decision about whether to team up with a new person. But the most important thing of all this stuff is, is stress testing people, they, namely spending enough time with them under difficult or trying circumstances. Right? A deadline is near. How do they react? Do they deliver upon promises or do they have excuses? Right? If you have excuses very early on in a relationship, whew, you better move on. Right? This is the kind of this is the time to say, listen, it's not working out. Part company. It's not altogether different from sort of dating in the, in the normal sense. Um, hiring, of course, people look very good on paper, but the live, in-person interview is in some sense a, a, an absolute must. But people are in their best behavior in interviews. So what can you do to, to as rapidly as possible, beyond the interview, do these other stress tests? And sometimes that's, that's you know, dinners and drinks. Sometimes that's, hey, why don't you chip in on this upcoming deadline and see how they react. Is do what you can to get as much larger data about them uh, early on as possible. Now, um, team building as a process, like plan writing as a process, is something that, that takes time. And, and, and even people who seem to work well with one another, even people who are complementary fits, the timing may not be right for them. So it's perfectly reasonable to part company on friendly and good terms, like what happened with Sanders. But there are also you know, more difficult ones, and I'm gonna close on, on those. Um, and in the end, you're looking for elements of character, because this is the stuff that, that, that 
comes out when it, things get really difficult. And almost everybody in their companies has difficult times. And yet not everybody is able to commit fully or wholly or, or, or whatever uh, at any given time. So people have ways of escalating. I think anybody can agree to band together in this class and say, okay, we're collaborating for the purpose of the class. If we continue to want to work together, fine. We can go into a business plan contest. If that works well, we can continue to go actually do business. But each one of those points of decision need to be win-win or no deal. That is to say, it's got to be in everybody's interest. Everybody wants to do it. Or if one person doesn't, then you really have to, to let that happen. And so, okay, fine. You've got to part company. Now, it gets a little tricky when you say, well, if, if uh, people who work together on an idea, can they both take the idea going forward? Um, and I think the best you can say is that, well, we collaborated together on a plan. And you can make whatever you want from that plan. But there are other things that are usually linked to a person. For example, their intellectual property or the status of their invention. And those things you, know, you may not be, be able to use if you part company. And it's just going into it. You have to appreciate and know that. Um, especially for people who are relatively inexperienced or, or people who have never done something before, even if they have lots of time in, in industry or in a sector. Uh, you know, sometimes it's unrealistic to take on the, the kind of the, the chief role for the company for real. Right? Mark Zuckerberg is really unusual um, as a CEO of the company. What's probably more realistic is that you take on uh, some sort of founder role, but founding employee, founding director, founding role, uh, that's not overall CEO uh, acting in some way. And that's, no, there's no shame in that. It's, it, so being aware of this might happen is better than having it imposed on you by a, by a board of directors, usually consisting of your investors, to have to then make a very strong arm move uh, to people who just didn't get it. Now, as a judge, I've spent some time as a judge in the 100K and read probably collectively, well, as a judge, several hundred plans. This is something people tend to screw up. Writing the section of the plan that spotlights the essence of their team, they tend to write about stuff that's not really as important. They talk about all these distractive things that a team member did and that's no doubt good. But the real punchline in the, team, the person's description in the team section should be what is it about this person's either background or what is it as unique as possible about them that's unusually relevant to the company that you're composing. So while everybody has long resumes and lots of stuff they could say about themselves, you want to uh, essentially do a personal elevator pitch for each person, and that's what ought to be written in that, in, that, in that section about them. What are they uniquely bringing to this particular new venture concept? Um, as was mentioned by well, several people now, it's very important to have advisors who you can also throw on there. It's extra credibility for your idea. You remember Bob Jones talking about his medical foods business. It was a big deal that he had a bunch of, of experts from Harvard Medical as, uh, as advisors. But the absolutely key thing is that you've asked them for permission. And, you know, I've had this happen to me. Somebody called me up and said, hey, I hear you're advising this company. What, do you, what can you tell me about it? I said, well, I didn't realize I was advising that company. You know, that's bad news. The person didn't ask me. And don't mistake a brief conversation in the hallway for agreeing to be an advisor. I mean, there's a, there's a difference. You have to be very explicit in, in that. Now, it can be a very informal thing, but it should be clear that the person said, yes, I'm happy to serve as an advisor for you and your company. And you can put that fact in your plan. Right. Now, second most challenging thing that people always looking for, and you've heard a little bit of that here, it's not easy to find people with whom you do stuff. And finding talent to a first approximation is a word of mouth thing, especially early days when you're a small organization or a few people, and you don't have a lot of credibility or reputation or visibility or brand recognition or any of those good things that will accrue to successful companies. So this is a winner to the success to the successful phenomenon that happens in recruiting people. So what you do have is is unique location, unique position, the, visit, the ability to say and have a direct conversation with people. But that requires being present and making known to your circle what you're interested in and who you're looking for, and to <clears throat> essentially use word of mouth. Make those people who know of your interests aware 
uh, and in turn, they end up suggesting people and making recommendations. This is a painstaking and time-consuming thing. It, it, I don't have good recommendation about how to speed it up. Of course you want to put the word out through relevant, more you know, digital and seemingly scalable circles, but the likelihood of a hit can also be proportionally lower. Um, it's just not easy. Now, some of the things that are useful are um, the clubs that are around sectoral themes, uh, as well as the events that are run in high quantity in the Boston metro area, and the classes that are taught at MIT. So back to this phases of innovation, it turns out that throughout MIT, we've got all sorts of learning by doing classes or action labs um, that, that cover this landscape. There's things that are quite exploratory about new designs. There's things like S-Lab or Leadership Lab or Tiger Teams that are dealing with the problems of big companies. All these things are collective offerings, or they're run as almost equivalent to a class by some club, like the Venture Ships. It's sort of a lightweight version of, of eLab. Or uh, Seed, the, the, the club whose event is this Thursday, they also have a lightweight mechanism to allow teams of students to work with existing companies and learn something from them. Uh, in my own case, a couple of you asked, so what do you do? Well, I co-instruct a handful of Ventures classes at the Media Lab. These around international development and imaging and neurotechnology and future cities uh, and, and uh, basically all things media. Um, look, you don't limit yourself to just your department or course number. I take a class in 15 if you're an engineer or an architect um, and vice versa. If you're over at Sloan, there's offerings in the Media Lab in, like for example, Tim Berners-Lee in Stata Center runs Link Data Ventures with colleagues. Right? That led to Roku as just one example company last year. So my point is these action lab classes are quite real. This map shows uh, just a dozen of the actual ongoing alum companies from just one of those classes uh, over the course of time that we've run the class. So this is serious. People meet each other and actually do stuff as a consequence of class experience. So finally, this is not easy. It's easy to say a lot of these things is tough to execute on successfully. There's an endless number of ways that people can, can disagree. These are some of them. Um, so let's go over those. You know, ideally, not instantly, like in this class per se, but soon enough, you should have had a conversation about, look, things are going well for now, but let's at least agree on if we end up coming to, to, to blows, <laughs> at least metaphorically, if we disagree on things, how are we going to resolve that? And, and it doesn't really matter which mechanism you pick. Just, if you can't agree on that, all right, this, this is not an easy, a good start. So try to agree on how you'll resolve disputes. Um, and, and, you know, very common ones are, like, look, we both trust this person who's relatively neutral to our particular organization. Let's be sure to call upon them to help us resolve the dispute. In my case, with the... the education media business, we said, look, if we really can't hash it out, we're ultimately going to use rock, paper, scissors, and we just decide which, whose way is it going to be. And then, very importantly, we also agree, okay, fine, once the decision is taken, we both, we all jump on board and don't quibble and don't backstab and do all the stuff that big companies are, are, are notorious for, right, politics, backstabbing, unethical behavior, saying one thing, doing another. Um, because if you can do that, then you can overcome reasonable disagreements. Uh, now, of course, there's some things that are unreasonable disagreements. It's hard to ultimately overcome those. One of the easy things to come to unreasonable <laughs> and other disagreements about is who owns the company? And you, you heard from Charlie his opinion. Everybody has their opinion. And that, unfortunately, is the, the big challenge here. You've had everything from one person owns all to everybody on the founding team has equally shared it. Just case examples. So a couple of dorm mates uh, started a company called Midnight Networks. And they said, well, there's six of them. So we'll split the company equally, one-sixth to everybody. And you know why I quibble about this? We're all in, we're gonna make it happen. And in their case, it worked. They were all in and they ended up successfully, ultimately selling the business. Uh, that was Virtual Link, Donald's first company. Now, in a later company, he didn't do this. But you'll see what happens to him and his co-founders 
uh, on Thursday when he reveals each stage of financing and how their relative stake in the business was diluted over time. So you, you'll see this in much closer detail, and he has his own strongly reasoned opinions about this. But look, that same group of MIT-related alums where they split the shares equally is matched by others who owned it all. Amar Bowles, professor here next door in Research Lab for Electronics, now emeritus, he owned most of Bose Corporation. Um, Pat McGovern of McGovern Institute for Brain Research, founder of International Data Group, majority owner. Keenan Sahin, Keenan Systems, sold it for a billion and a half, owned everything. Gave his employees a bowl of fruit as their bonus. That really pissed off a lot of people, um, unfortunately. But he managed to build this company, owning everything. It can happen. I mean, if it's un unusual because that means being having a very um, owning attitude from the very beginning. It usually means having early customers. It means not having diluted your holdings by getting outside investors. And that can happen, especially if you have a customer in hand, something that Bob Jones emphasized. So therefore, the vast majority is in the last bucket of mix. And unfortunately, there's, there's people assert those rules of thumb, but it's unclear to me that there are. Um, in this context, I especially recommend uh, there's a number of investors who are sort of well known as being fairly entrepreneur friendly, or at least transparency friendly. They want everybody to know the terms. And we're going to be fortunate tomorrow night to see one of them. Brad Feld is among the people who've made a point of educating the broader entrepreneurial community about term sheets, about terms, about reasonable shares. So his Feld.com blog. And the blogs he recommends as being good about helping people you know, reveal these kind of details and patterns uh, is you know, especially worthwhile. But really, it's up to you to do this research at the point where you're actually making serious decisions about, about um, the splitting of shares. So uh, uh, when I first ran the entrepreneur the 100K, it was, uh, my first year was very difficult because we had a great winner. But the guy with the idea had very unrealistic idea expectations for who owned what. Because while he had a great idea, and it was a high-quality market opportunity, he didn't know how to make it happen. And yet also on the team was a, an engineer who came on board because he did know how to make it happen. Those two can never come to agreements about this. And at the time, I was too ignorant to do anything useful in advising them about overcoming their disagreement. So it was a source of tremendous frustration that a great idea was stillborn because the people involved couldn't get it together. And unfortunately, this has happened too often. That, that some or others of the, the team members who are crucial to the thing going forward um, end up saying, you know, I own everything. This is my idea. And being so off-putting to the others that what was a compelling possibility ends up dissolving. Um, so to the extent that you can find these things out about each other earlier, uh, it's better than, better than later. Uh, and, and things like the agreements about, you know, okay, we agree to disagree, but all that stuff I said earlier, you, this is the kind of stuff that you want to at least document with email so that you can say it wasn't my assertion and my recollection dominating it. There's something that you can point at. We're not talking about a legal agreement, but, but some place that, that you can point to that's a little bit more objective than memory. Um, all right, apply all those, uh, those things to everybody you meet. The term due diligence is important here. It basically means be sure to look into a person in a more than superficial way. Right, so obviously, it's to doing web searches and so forth. But, so for example, you ask somebody, well, who's worked with you before? And can I talk to them? Well, you should at least talk to those people. But you also want to find out who else worked with them who they didn't list. And you may not hear a pretty story. It may not be what you wanted to hear but at least it will be more revealing. And that process of tracking down whoever else a person used to work with or has connected with in the past and engaging with them, e calling them, emailing them, scribing them, that is, um, you know, it requires an investment, a time commitment. And usually you read it that you didn't do it because it seemed like you were too busy at the time. And therefore you couldn't spare the time early on. Well, you would have saved yourself a hell of a lot more time had you done this kind of thing. Now, who's especially, you know, realizes this? The investors. 
So the flip side is also true, that, that you better appreciate that people will be doing this about you and your company, just like you should be doing this about your potential partners, your potential employees, and for that matter, your potential investors. They, in turn, will be doing it on you. So it's in your interest to not, uh, you know, you, you want to have a, as ethical as possible, as clean as possible a track record. Now, that said, there's going to be, you're going to have disputes in your past. People are going to have parted company. You're going to have been fired, like multiple entrepreneurs have been from past companies. Those are not necessarily killers. You can survive a due diligence review, um, but you just have to have an, a, you know, there has to be good reasons. You have to say, what did you learn from that? You have to say, look, here's the essence of the disagreement. You have to be able to share what happened in a more, in a relatively dispassionate fashion. Because the last thing a new person engaging with you wants to hear is your bitter, dirty laundry about a past experience, right? That actually makes you look worse in their eyes more often than not. So you have to be very circumspect in, in, in the, the, the ripples that you leave in your social environment uh, because ultimately negative reputation can come back and, and, and bite you. Ah, uh, yes. These are the hardest things to ultimately discover about other people, and, and yet uh, they're the worst. Um, so I want to conclude with some actual case examples from our circumstances here. Um, these are actual companies that have come through the class or through MIT 100K Entrepreneurship Competition or other classes that we know about. And I gave you the med medical device case already, the entrepreneur in my first year of the competition. Um, in the uh, office good case, uh, he had a person who seemed on paper fantastic, but wasn't delivering the goods very early on. And they had agreed to enter MIT Business Plan Contest, but they needed to fire that person just before the actual deadline. Because then, by then it was apparent that they weren't contributing. So this is a person who thought they were on the team, that were, then they were dropped with cause just before that deadline. I mean, this, you can imagine, this is something where there are two sides to this, two opinions about what happened. Very good decision for the team in the end. They were angry with each other for a while, or at least the one who was eased out was, but now they've, they've come to terms, and I think that other person realizes that this is probably a good move for them. Softbotics is incredibly frustrating. This is a company which um, ultimately was sold for quite a lot of money, but right at the threshold of getting their venture investment, one of the people who helped in the business plan competition came, but who wasn't part of the ongoing venture, came out of the woodwork and said, you know, I should own a piece of this. It sued just at a critical time for the company to close on a round of financing. So what ended up happening is, in a sense, they were extorted into paying off this outside person. And this, I think, was a consequence of not having been very clear about participation is win-win or no deal. You're, you're participating in the class, and then we have to decide do we participate in a competition or not. So in this case, they had to pay hush money, go away money, to get that person out of their hair, because otherwise they were going to screw up a multi-million dollar fundraise. In, uh, 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 that's Chipko, actually. Softbotics is three founders. Uh, one, at the very last minute, decided, no, I have a different vision for the future of the company. So it was not, not a, it was an actual co-founder who, who, who kept quiet about the plan to go raise money until the absolute last minute, and then said, you know, I think we should instead go slow. He had a different idea about what to do. Um, incredibly frustrating for the people involved. No idea. Complete came totally out of left field. And yet I asked them, like, look, knowing what you know now, were there early signals? Yes. Wasn't paying attention uh, to key meetings. We sent an email saying, here's what we decided, but there was never an, an actual response agreeing to the decision. It was this kind of latent, pent-up disagreement that finally came to a head. Um, so had they been paying more close attention and acting upon their observation, that probably could have been avoided. Um, in Softix, the money and one of the co-founders decided that the CEO wasn't cutting it anymore uh, and surprised him by saying, you know, we need you to move on. Um, so very bitter at the time. Ultimately, it was a healthy thing for both parties. And I think the lesson learned there is how they handle it. That, that earlier communication about frustrations would have probably been better than the big surprise suddenly. Um, Artco, you know, 
people um, band together with certain thing in mind, and then as that shifts and mods over time, uh, you can have the basis for an ultimately a big dispute about the direction of the company. And, and if it's two versus one of three founders, you can be strong-armed uh, one way or another, you know, sooner or later into into moving out and, and probably relinquishing some fraction of um, your your holdings. And then finally, the, one of the most frustrating examples of not having having had these kind of resolutions or agreements about how to disagree early is um, was a team that actually won the business plan competition that, or at least one of the prizes. Uh, and one of the team members said, "Yeah, I don't want to do this as a business, but I was essential to." doing what it took to get the money. I want my slice. I'm not committed to this company at all, but I want my slice. And unfortunately, it's that experience that is what has influenced the business plan competition organizers to, to create the rule structure they have now, where you have to, the company, the money goes to a company that has to be incorporated by people who, the, who have decided to incorporate. It used to be that there was more flexibility about the use of the money and the timing of the acceptance of the money. So look. You know, there's a, a, a million and one ways to, to, for things to go wrong. I can't list all of those. But I can give you these real examples to just emphasize that this stuff is important, to have thought this stuff through and to have tried to do as best as you can, as early as possible, to find out enough about your classmates and your partners and your teammates um, so that you have the opposite case, a great case, where you really... Um, uh, build what, what becomes a, a, a viable venture and you, you each participate in some in some good fashion in that success. Then can do the things that I've pointed out on the map of MIT that, you know, philanthropically you feed back in a, in a good way or invest in whatever you think is compelling next. Right? But that doesn't happen until you have a successful company and organization. So that's the, that's it. We covered most of that stuff. Um, I want to conclude on that. So I hope that this has been a useful summary of of not only sort of MIT entrepreneurial landscape in part, but also on, on the things you ought to be paying attention to, people issues that matter. Good on. Questions? <laughs> Anything burning? Otherwise, um, let's go into our break, Joe, and a few minutes of questions. Let's go into the break, and I'm, of course, available for one on one or, or other. other Conversations. Anybody? Shout it out or repeat the question. Uh, okay. Wow. Okay. Give it a break and see you here at uh, by that clock, uh, seven forty-seven. <laughs>